So on any other weekend, you might have been looking forward to getting all dressed up and going on a date. Maybe with your partner, maybe with someone you just started seeing, or maybe even a first date. But obviously this weekend is not a regular weekend. We're not supposed to be going out or really interacting with anyone we don't live with. So are we supposed to just put our love lives on pause? Take them to FaceTime? We're all learning how to wash our hands and self-isolate properly, but there's no protocol for this. So is it still possible to date and maintain our romantic relationships while practicing social distancing? My guest today says absolutely, and she has a lot of really good tips for getting through this time for people at any phase of a relationship. Her name is Jess O'Reilly, and she's a sexologist and the host of the Sex with Dr. Jess podcast. From Global News, I'm Tamara Kandaker, and you're listening to Wait, There's More. Hi, Jessica. Thanks so much for doing this. It's my pleasure. I'm sitting at home with more time than I'm used to. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) So let's start with online dating. A lot of us are practicing social distancing and we're bored, so we're swiping the apps, maybe for the first time. So For people who are new to this, can you offer any quick tips when it comes to making their profile or making conversation with people? First and foremost, can you please be honest in your profiles? Use a photo from the last year. Don't lie about your age, your height, your weight, your occupation, because all the data shows that almost everybody consistently lies in their profile. And then they complain about other people lying in their profile. So, you know, be the change you want to be, set the example. And I I think that the more honest you are, the more you will hopefully attract folks who are like-minded. And is the coronavirus a good icebreaker? (laughs) I would say yes and no. So jokes about the coronavirus, probably not. But asking how somebody's doing and checking in has become the norm. I actually think this is a really positive silver lining that has arisen from this global pandemic, every email I receive, whether I have a great relationship with the person, a neutral one, or it's a brand new relationship, I feel that everybody is checking in to see how others are doing. And they seem to be asking with genuine care. Similarly, every phone call tends to begin with a check-in. And I think this is a great, uh, a great way just to show that, you know, you're, you're emotionally literate and open to hearing a range of responses. Because honestly, let's, let's be honest in the West, when you say, how you're doing. You don't actually really mean it. You're not looking to find out exactly how someone's feeling. And I think this is an exception. And maybe this will hopefully spill over even after this this issue becomes cleared up. So I'm hearing a lot of friends say that they're actually having pretty good luck on the apps these days. So people are responding to messages and holding conversations, which, you know, sometimes die on these apps pretty quickly. Do we know if people are using the apps more right now? Are they spending more time on them? Well, we we have some apps reporting that their user user base is going up and that the number of minutes spent conversing with other people is increasing. And, and this simply makes sense because all digital technology platforms are seem to be experiencing uh, an increase in, in user traffic. I mean, think about normally you and I would be meeting face to face and now instead we're using some sort of a digital platform to record. Uh, so it makes sense that there's an increase in usage. And so maybe that means there are more choices out there, better choices out there. I I love that you're saying that you're reporting that people are spending more time talking rather than just, you know, working from an, an economy of of reaching out to 2,000 people with a high, 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 high. I think that's really cool. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. So maybe there's an upside to this, like people slowing down to get to know a person because there's no distractions. Yeah, I think being more attentive and just being more mindful because we're not rushing through everything the way we normally do. So even with our meals, we tend to kind of shove them in our mouths because we want to get back to work or we need to get to the next thing. But now that we're forced into, you know, private confines, we have time to slow down and really sip the coffee or drink the tea or enjoy the wine or, you know, take a bite and eat more mindfully. And I think that's actually going to translate into the bedroom. When we get more in touch with the physical pleasures in life, it, it you know, becomes transferable into sexual experiences. So 
So from what I've read, a lot of people are still taking this risk and meeting up with people that they're meeting on the apps. Is that a good idea right now? No, we know the answer is no. Social isolation doesn't mean meeting new people. It doesn't mean inviting a friend over for drinks or coffee. The public health agencies have come out and been very clear about that. If there was any ambiguity a few days ago, it is no longer ambiguous, especially if you're on social media. And so I think we all need to take responsibility. It is not time to stop dating, but it is time to stop dating in the flesh. There are many ways to date online. People are having their first dates over coffee in their kitchens. How intimate is that? So I've got my coffee, you've got your coffee. You can learn about the fact that I like to weigh my beans and hand grind them. And maybe I learned that you just drink drip coffee, not just you drink. Drip. Look at that judgment. <laughs> uh, so I, I, there are so many ways to date. Uh, we're using the language of social distancing, but I think a more appropriate term is physical distancing. So we don't actually need to be antisocial or non-social. We're just social in different ways. Right. So if you look up articles about dating, there are some that say it's okay to meet in a public park in a place that's not so busy where you can sit three to six feet apart. But now there is way less ambiguity about that. The most common recommendation now is to just stay put, don't go outside until unless you absolutely need to. So you're saying that it is a good idea to have a first date over video chat. And is do you have any advice for people who maybe haven't done that ever? Yeah. Okay. So I think it's a great idea if you're willing to push your comfort zone a little. And if you've never done this, I mean, I've never done that. Although I had my first birthday party over uh, video chat the other night with some oh, fam- wow. yeah with some family members. I sent the same food to to them because we're in we're in close proximity in terms of neighborhood, and we all had the same type of food from the same restaurant. And and I think don't feel too much pressure. Uh, I think that sometimes we think with a video chat that you need to be tuned into the video at every moment in time, almost like you're having a job interview. And it doesn't need to be like that. You can simply be eating your food and commenting on the food and, you know, talking about what you're feeling and what's going on. Maybe you even make dinner or lunch or breakfast together. And so you have a distraction. We would call it in person. We would call it a shoulder to shoulder versus a face to face interaction. So if you were to, for example, say, yeah, let's have lunch tomorrow. You can learn about one another because maybe I'm making a simple sandwich and you're putting together an elaborate quiche and we can talk about what you're making. So we can get to know one another's personalities and one another's energies and one another's interests and food passions without spending the whole time interrogating one another. And I actually think this is a really positive thing because when you go on a date, oftentimes you're analyzing this person's behavior from what they order to how they eat to how they interact. But rather than analyzing whether or not someone is a good fit for you, why not just focus on how you're feeling in the moment? If we can focus on how we feel in another person's presence, I think we can gauge better whether or not we're going to be a good fit more effectively than simply saying, oh, how tall are they? What color is their hair? What do they do for a living? And you don't have to constantly be say, asking questions. How many siblings did you have? Where did you grow up? You know, where, you know, what's your workplace like? Instead, you're literally talking about your ingredients and what you're going to eat. Yeah, that actually does sound a lot less intimidating. And what about if you're in the early stages of a relationship and you have met this person and you've gone on a bunch of dates, how do you make sure that things don't fizzle out? Oh, that's, I think that's the perfect time to be chatting over video, to be meeting up over video, even casually. Uh, We notice this with teens and folks in their 20s. Oftentimes, they've got their partners on the line. (laughs) They're they're FaceTiming or they've got some sort of video chat on and they're going about their day in their homes. They're separated by space and you don't even realize that their partner is on the line. So, you know, you can take them with you on a journey. Maybe you decide to even work together where you sit together online and you check in with each other every 25 minutes or something like that. So yeah, definitely stay connected and it can be intimate and it can be sexual. I have on my website a passion interview that is great for people who have just met as well as helpful to people who have been together 20 years. So this is a time to kind of explore the relationship in new ways and ask one another questions that aren't superficial. You know, what are your greatest passions? What are your most exciting memories? And so I have all those prompts that I can send you for your show notes as well. Okay. And what advice do you have for people who 
want to take things to the next level and are craving physical intimacy? Well, number one, you can be physically intimate with yourself. And number two, we have all these different layers of digital sex that we can engage with. So obviously we can be texting each other to let the other person know what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're craving. You So you can be using your words and emojis. If you take it to the next level, you might be sending some sexy images. And I know that people get their guard up and get their back up when we talk about sexting because sexting is seen as this, you know, frightening, negative, high risk experience. But in fact, it's not that high risk, especially if you take precautions. So the main risk with sexting is that the photos could be leaked. So maybe you don't include your face in it. Maybe you lower the lights so you can show parts of your body, you can show close-ups, you can leave lots to the imagination. And then if we go beyond sexting, we've got voice notes. And I love the idea of voice notes because so many of us are audio learners. I have a new book called The Ultimate Guide to Seduction and Foreplay. My co-author is Marla Renee Stewart, and she conceived of the learning style approach to sex and seduction, meaning the way you learn is also the way you welcome and positively interpret seduction and sexual pleasure. So if, for example, if you're an audio learner, you're more likely to really enjoy the sound of your partner's voice and even the sound of your own voice and really tune into different volumes and tones and ways of speaking and new language. And again, you know, we're talking about sex and intimacy, so it might be something really sweet, it might be something really affirming, and it might be something really sexual depending on what you're into and what your partner has consented to. So I love the idea of voice notes. And then maybe we pick it up a notch and we have a phone session where we talk about something sexy. And phone sex does not need to end in some specific sexual outcome. It could just be about talking with regard to your sexual desires, values, fantasies. And I always say you can begin with the past, the present, and the future. So let's, if you've already met, talk about some of the things you've done together, some of your highlight reels, your memories, the things that really turn you on. If maybe you haven't met, you can talk about what you're feeling in the present moment, what you're doing, what you're wearing, what you're about to do, and then move on to the future to discuss the things that you might do together when you come back together. And that's how you really get that dopamine rush because dopamine, that that neurochemical we associate with reward and pleasure is activated at a higher level when you're anticipating reward than when you actually receive the reward itself. And then for couples who are into it, you might even engage in something sexy via video. Now, I know this sounds super intimidating to a lot of people. So again, let me just say, however you're feeling at this moment in time, in this time of crisis, uncertainty, stress, and physical threat, no pressure. If you want lots of sex, go ahead and have the digital sex. If you don't want sex, that's okay too. For many of us, it's the farthest thing from our minds right now because we're just trying to take care of ourselves, our families, and our you know financial livelihoods. But if you are in the mood and you're new to video sex, maybe you just do it for one minute where you turn the lights down really, really low or entirely off so your partner can't really make out what's happening on the other end. You leave much to the imagination. They have to do the deciphering, but it's still really hot because you know something is happening. Okay, so bottom line is the possibilities are endless and you just have to get a little bit creative. Absolutely. I always say that there are folks that I work with who see problems that can't be fixed. And then there are folks that I work with who see challenges. And people who see problems tend to make excuses. And people who see challenges tend to make change. And you generally can't make excuses and make change. We'll be right back. Can we talk about couples who are living together or still seeing each other in person? Should anyone in an existing relationship be changing their sexual behavior? That's a good question. I, I would want to defer to the directives from public health agencies on this, but I will say, for example, if one of you has been traveling internationally and you've been told to socially isolate, that will mean 
that you also are going to try and socially distance from the person within your house. So if the person is high risk, so if we're talking about somebody who's older or immunocompromised, uh, you're going to do your best to actually not come into contact with that person. I know in some cases people have found alternative living arrangements for that person where they'll be safer during the 14 days of self-isolation. If it's a, you know, somebody who is maybe young and, and healthy, you're still going to want to socially distance. And I know that in, you know, for example, in big cities like Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal and Calgary, where space is at a premium and real estate is expensive, we don't all have spare bedrooms. Um, So I think we have to get a little bit creative and really just be monitoring our symptoms. And you know right now that there are online screenings. If you have any symptoms at all, I know getmaple.ca has free online screenings if you have any symptoms at all, if you've been traveling, if you come back. So if, however, you have been living under the same circumstances. So I can give you the example of my husband and I are currently in self-isolation because we had been traveling abroad, but we've been traveling together. So we're self-isolating together and we haven't had to change anything. So if you don't have to change anything for safety purposes, I would say this is the perfect time to revolutionize your relationship and sex life because meetings are canceled, trips are canceled, there are fewer distractions unless you decide to engage with every little piece of news. And this is a time to have more meaningful conversations, to talk to one another about your sexual values. What are the messages you received about sex when you were younger? What were the sources of those messages? Do you value those sources? Are there messages you want to retain, messages you want to discard? Uh, You know, how important is sex to you? What are the practical, personal, emotional, and physical elements of sex that matter to you. These are conversations that we should be having with ourselves and then with our partners. And what better time to have them than when you actually have the time. Now, having said that, it's not all rainbows and sunshines. This is a time where Like the directives are changing daily and we're all feeling really nervous. For others, if you feel your stress just doesn't feel that manageable, maybe it's not the time to dive into these vulnerable conversations, but maybe you could just take an extra 10 minutes a day to lie together and just breathe together because we have evidence that the body syncs up when you connect physically with your partner. If you look one another in the eyes, if you hold hands, what happens is your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breath rate, all of these functions can begin to get in sync. And getting in sync physically can help you to also get in sync emotionally. So I want to just emphasize that I don't want to pressure people to, uh, you know, create one specific outcome during this time. But if you do have uh, the extra time, can you invest it in your relationship? We just talked about investing time in your relationship and maybe using this time that you have together to your advantage. But for a lot of people, this is maybe the first time that they've had to be with their partner for an extended period of time. Both people are working from home, both people are stressed (laughs) out, maybe starting to drive each other a bit crazy. What advice do you have for people in that situation where you're stuck with your partner and you can't leave and you're just driving each other nuts? First and foremost, if you have the space, physically distance. If you have a separate room, work in separate rooms. If you have separate floors, work on separate floors because it can feel really exciting to be together for long periods of time when you're used to missing one another, but you will wear on one another and your work habits are different if you're not accustomed to working together. I also suggest that you make schedules uh, for yourself. So at what point in the day do you invest in work? At what point in the day do you invest in your physical health, in your relationship? So I have a list on my whiteboard in front of me where every day I want to do one thing uh, to make an improvement to the house. Maybe that's organizing a drawer or hanging a painting. Every day I want to make one health investment, physical health, one mental health investment. So today, for example, I woke up and rather than going straight to work like I normally do, I read 15 minutes uh, fiction for pleasure. Uh, I want to accomplish one business decision every day or something related to business growth. And then I want to do one check-in with my family and friends over text or over video. And I want to take some time to invest in my relationship every day. So that might be just a 60 second hand massage. That may mean snuggling while we curl up and watch a show. But those are my six 
focus pieces for this quarantine. Uh, We're on day five right now. And uh, rather than dividing my time, I've decided to divide my focus. Other people have decided to divide their time. My husband, for example, works for a few hours and then he does a workout. Then he works for a few hours and then he studies his Spanish, something for personal development. And so, and I think if you can do little favors to make your partner feel important, that can go a long way as well. So my husband this morning made me breakfast. I make him a smoothie. Uh, If you can be kind to one another and try and out nice one another, I think that you'll be able to let some of the friction go and it will help to have some of the tension dissipate. I think people will find that really, really helpful. What else have you been getting asked by people? What are some of the top questions and concerns that people have been coming to you with in the past little while? Most people are really worried about social isolation because they're talking about social distancing when really I think we could be talking about physical distancing. So we're still going to be social in other ways. And so folks are wondering, so how how do I stay connected to my friends? And I think the answer is, you know, pretty obvious to many people that you you text, you chat, you check in. And there's a therapist in Toronto named Jake Ernst, and I just interviewed him today, and he came up with the concept of the quarantine. So creating a team to support you through this time, because what what we have to remember, and this is a big question that I'm getting, what do you do if you don't feel safe and supported in the space you live in? What if you're living with family and, you know, you have a really antagonistic relationship with a parent or a sibling? What if you're with a roommate and you're just not getting along? What if you're going through a rocky patch in your relationship? And so some of the things that we discussed are physical distancing. Sometimes I need to go into my room and if I'm not feeling safe, I need to reach out to, as Jake says, my quarantine and ask them for support and say, you know, send me puppy pictures or can you hop hop on a phone call? So I think that creating that team around your support is so important. I want to make sure I give credit to Jake Ernst, who on Instagram is full of incredible advice that I find really, really soothing just seeing his posts. So you can follow him. It's at MSW Jake. Jess, I have learned so much and honestly could listen to you talk all day, but we'll let you go. And thank you so much for doing this. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, that's the show. Thanks so much for listening. A couple of quick updates on the new COVID-19 related restrictions at the U.S.-Canada border, which we talked about earlier this week. The ban on non-essential travel between the two countries goes into effect at midnight tonight. And earlier today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced that asylum seekers who cross the border irregularly into Canada will automatically be sent back to the U.S. Today, Canada and the United States are announcing a reciprocal arrangement where we will now be returning irregular migrants who attempt to cross anywhere at the Canada-U.S. border. Around the world, the number of COVID-19 cases is still rising. As of Friday afternoon, there are at least 244,000 infections and 10,000 deaths. That's it for now. Wait There's More is produced by Rachel Brown and me, Tamara Kendacker. Sound design and mixing is by Stephanie Werner with help from Rob Johnston. Our editorial assistant is Michael Furtado, and our executive producer is George Brown. I hope you stay inside and stay safe this weekend, and I'll talk to you on Monday.